George Wentworth is uh, an attorney and a uh, senior staff attorney at the National Employment Law Project. And the National Employment Law Project, or as we affectionately refer to it as NELP in our office, uh, it's based in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., has in-depth analysis, rigorous research, uh, expert legal advice and technical assistance, coalition building and leadership, communications and education, all around the issue of employment law. Uh, George uh, joined NELP in 2009 after 35 years of service with the Connecticut Department of Labor. And as Director of Program Policy, he served as General Counsel to the Labor Commissioner for 20 years. And in that role, George oversaw the development of all legal policy within the agency, supervised the agency's in-house legal staff, coordinated regulatory activities, and interpreted a wide range of workplace statutes. He was the Chief Drafter of Connecticut's Unemployment Insurance Regulations. And at NELP, George works with state organizations like the North Carolina Justice Center, uh, advocating for strong unemployment insurance programs. He's testified before a number of state legislatures, and he's also been a part of NELP's efforts to ensure a meaningful federal response to the national crisis and long-term unemployment. But before George comes on, we're delighted all to have uh, my colleague at the North Carolina Justice Center, Alan Fryer. Alan's a policy analyst with the Budget and Tax Center Project. And he only joined us, is that right, in June of 2011? It feels like you've been there for years. Um, obviously, he's quickly ensconced himself as one of the uh, really effective people in the, in the office in the, in the Justice Center. He's a public policy analyst focusing on economic and workforce development issues and economic analysis. He has over a decade of experience in federal, state, and local economic development policy, including service as a policy advisor to three members of the United States Congress. Uh, and as an independent economic uh, consultant to nonprofits, universities, state and local government agencies. We're delighted to have Alan with us. We're glad all of you could be here with us. All the folks who will be watching online, uh, in, uh, we're delighted that you're joining us as well. So without further ado, why don't I have Alan Fryer come up. And please welcome. <laughs> Well, thanks. It's great to be here with y'all. I am obviously the, uh, the warm-up act for George, so I'll try to be as quick as possible. Um, and I'm really just trying to set the stage for um, George's analysis of how we can move forward. And I'm really just going to talk about how we got here. Um, brief, very brief thumbnail sketch um, of the sort of the main conditions of the debate here. Um, we recognize that unemployment insurance is a critical lifeline for unemployed workers. Um, the big sort of policy discussion right now is how to fix this $2.8 billion debt that North Carolina, the state, owes to the federal government um, as, it, as the state tried to grapple with the historic loss of jobs during the, the Great Recession. Um, it's important to really to recognize that, that dealing with, this, with the debt and the trust fund uh, comes at the same time when the needs for unemployment insurance have never been higher. Um, as we can see, if we just start with unemployment, um, these, these next few graphs won't be a surprise to anyone, um, but unemployment uh, grew much faster and much, much higher in the Great Recession than any previous recession, and unfortunately we're still there. Uh, in, in every single previous recession going back to the 1950s, we had already replaced all the jobs that we lost during the recession, and that is, as you can see from the graphs, and the graph is nowhere near the case now. And much of this is driven by long-term unemployment. North Carolina actually has um, a much higher or somewhat higher percentage of long-term unemployed than um, the nation as a whole does. And by long-term unemployed, we're talking about folks who have been, uh, uh, have been out of work for more than 26 weeks. So we are, um, our, our long-term unemployed are a significant drag uh, on the labor market's recovery. And we see this with what we call the, the jobs deficit, continue, which continues to grow. Um, the jobs deficit is the number of jobs that the state needs to create in order to catch up to all the jobs we lost during the Great Recession and keep up with population growth, which we've experienced about 8% uh, population growth since the end of the recession. Uh, so there are a lot of new jobs that need to come open to, to catch up with those folks. Um, this highlights the fact that, that contrary to views you might hear uh, in the legislature here around the state, 
Um, the problem here is the fundamental lack of available jobs. It's not that folks aren't, well, don't want work, they're just hanging out, it's they're just not the number of available job openings. Um, there are, uh, in the entire Southeast, there are about three uh, workers for every one single available job opening. So it doesn't matter um, if you lose your unemployment benefits, it doesn't matter if you go get training and get trained for a new industry, there are still not enough jobs for every single worker. Uh, and this is the fundamental driving reality, economic reality, behind the policy decisions that need to be made about how to address the unemployment insurance system. Uh, I've alluded to this, um, the, the, uh, I've alluded to this already, this idea that we have this $2.8 billion debt in the unemployment trust fund, uh, unemployment insurance trust fund. Um, when times were flush, the, uh, the state adopted a pay-as-you-go method for financing unemployment, uh, the unemployment insurance system in the state. So when the 2001 recession hit and the 2007 recession hit, there was just an inadequate amount of funding in the, the trust fund uh, to meet the rising demands of the unemployed workers as a result of the economic downturn. So these are specific, <laughs> these are the specific changes that the legislature made in the 90s when times were flush um, that basically uh, led to the, the structural financing problems in the trust fund. The state cut taxes four times and gave outright tax holidays to employers for their share of contributions to the trust fund twice. Um, so the upshot has been that at the time when the state needed as much money in the trust fund as possible, the money wasn't there because of unwise financing decisions in the previous decade. We see in this graph how uh, trust fund solvency actually collapsed after the mid-90s. And you can see this is starting in 2001 through the end of the decade, this is exactly when the state was losing the most jobs. So at the time when the need was the most, the financing available to help unemployed workers was the lowest. And the result was this $2.8 billion debt that the state owes to the federal government. Um, the way that this system works uh, is that if the, the state has a shortfall, is unable to meet the needs of current unemployed workers, they're able to borrow from the federal government. Uh, but of course, the feds want their money back. So uh, the state is currently grappling with, um, first, how to pay back the debt to the federal government, and second, uh, secondly, uh, trying to determine how to finance the system going forward. Unfortunately, um, much of the debate that we've heard uh, has not necessarily been focused as much on reduce, trying to reduce the, the debt in a balanced way and, and structure financing in a balanced way. Instead, what we've, uh, the proposal that we've seen that was released by the Chamber and is actually Chamber of Commerce and is, uh, is going to move through revenue laws tomorrow, actually cuts benefits um, by, what was the figure towards $600 million or something like that. Um, the story that has not been told as much is that the proposal that's moving through revenue laws tomorrow actually cuts payroll taxes for businesses even more. So at the same time, we're going to have a $600 million bite taken out of workers' benefits we're also going to be cutting the taxes of businesses, um, uh, asking them to pay less at a time when probably in order to make up the, the shortfall to help pay off the debt, the employer should be asked to pay more. So the three, or the last three things I, I will leave you with here. Um, the, the state's employer contributions to the unemployment insurance system are already among the lowest in the country. Um, one of the arguments that you'll hear is that if we increase the contributions employers are asked to pay, the taxes employers are asked to pay, it's going to scare off industry uh, and so they won't be able to create the jobs that we need to actually reduce the, um, the levels of unemployment that we saw before. Um, North Carolina does have the lowest in the country uh, in terms of the contributions that are required. So we're all re we already seem to be um, not necessarily at a competitive disadvantage if, uh, if if unemployment insurance taxes did present some kind of disadvantage. Well, it doesn't lead up. Um, unemployment insurance taxes represent a very small percent of the total cost of adding an employee to your payroll. So increasing, increasing the taxes really would have a marginal, marginal impact on, on employers. Um, uh, on the other hand, though, uh, slashing benefits actually reduces 
the um, stabilizing effects that, un that the un unemployment insurance is expected to have or supposed to have, intended to have on the economy. Right? If you take more money out of, from, from workers, unemployed workers, they have less money to spend at local businesses. And that's the, the, um, the shortfall of customers, we know, is, is one of the big concerns facing businesses as they look to hire. So, uh, George is going to talk about where we go from here. Um, this is just a, basically the, the policy context. If you have any more questions, we have a report um, written by our director, Alexander Sorota. I think that was, it's available on the, on the back table. It goes to the analysis, particularly on the relationship between the cuts and benefits um, and the, what, what we've analyzed to be um, tax cuts for businesses. So if you have any questions, if you're looking for come talk to me afterwards. And uh, George, thanks. <coughs> Let me get this set up for you here real fast. All right, there we go. Take the mic's working great. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for having me down. Um, I work out of uh, NELP's uh, New York office. Uh, as uh, Rob alluded to, I, I, uh, I'm a Connecticut native, uh, but uh, everybody's been very gracious to me here. I want to want to thank Bill Rowe uh, in particular, uh, but also Sabina, and uh, just to tell you, you're very lucky to have um, people who are knowledgeable about unemployment insurance leading the ground fight, and I include Alexandra Sirota, who's written some really um, remarkably uh, detailed and uh, accurate assessments in papers that are in the back of the room. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the national picture uh, because what's going on in North Carolina uh, is, is not new. There, has, um, there have been more than half of the states uh, in the U.S. have had to borrow from the federal government uh, as a result of this recession, but let, maybe we just sort of walk it through um, kind of quickly. Um, as I think you all know, the recession uh, hit at the end of 2007, hard to believe, but unemployment was at 4.6% uh, uh, just a few years ago, and uh, by uh, early 2009, we were over 9% after uh, the financial meltdown, and uh, unemployment stayed over 8% nationally for 43 consecutive months, just coming down below 8%. Uh, in the last quarter of, of 2012. We still have 16 states out there with unemployment rates that are 8% or higher, and five states, including North Carolina, with an unemployment rate that's higher than 9%. So um, we talked about the, um, the impact of unemployment insurance on the economy. Uh, in the, from the beginning of the recession through 2011, uh, unemployment insurance, including the federal extensions, the Emergency Unemployment Compensation uh, Program, uh, pumped $260 billion into the national economy during a time in which consumer demand was really at its lowest point uh, since the Great Depression. So that's a really, uh, I, I was saying to somebody earlier, a very kind of traditional notion that's get, that gets lost in a lot of the slashing and burning is that unemployed workers, uh, as, as uh, Mr. Andrew was saying um, from the AFL, they're not out putting their money in the bank. Uh, they are spending it on food. They're spending it on rent and mortgage and clothing for their kids and just basically keeping their families together until they can get to that next job. Unfortunately, it's taking longer and longer to get to that next job. Nationally, uh, we've got uh, 40, uh, 40% of every unemployed worker in this country, and there's 12 million of them, 5 million of them have been out of work six months or longer. Uh, the average duration of unemployment in this country is 40 weeks. So to be talking about cutting this program, particularly cutting the duration of the program at this time, seems uh, pretty remarkable. But this is what we have been seeing basically since 2011, as a lot of um, governors and legislative legislatures went to uh, one party in 2011. You started seeing states that had had to borrow to keep their unemployment systems in place 
uh, start looking for roads back to solvency that were very heavily on the backs of workers and without really any sort of balance or corresponding uh, increases in revenues from, from employers. So when you look at all this money that was spent, um, about uh, 85 billion of it, you could say, is really tied to uh, the increase in unemployment. Now, why is that important? We said we spent 260 billion, but 85 billion was because unemployment had jumped up so dramatically. What it means is that's about a third of, of what was spent. It means that the state should have been prepared for about two thirds of that spending, uh, uh, even uh, you know without a recession. And uh, yet, uh, borrowing um, 35 states uh, had to borrow about 50 billion dollars um, since 2008, and uh, not quite half of that has um, been repaid. We still have 26 uh, billion dollars in outstanding debt to the federal government, and then it's it's actually worse than that because there's another 10 billion that states have elected to basically shift their borrowing over to um, to the private bond market and have basically bonded their debt. So there's another $10 billion of bonded debt. So as we said, North Carolina has um, been over, was over 10% unemployment rate from March of 2009 through January 2012, still more than a percent higher than the national. Your long-term unemployment is higher than the national. 46.6% uh, uh, of uh, North Carolina's 400,000 plus unemployed workers have been out of work for more than six months. Uh, this is just a chart that shows uh, how unemployment's been paid out uh, in um, North Carolina since the beginning of the recession, uh, and um, this is billions. Uh, so um, the as I and this is something we probably ought to clear up early on because this gets into the the whole issue about duration because one of the major cuts being proposed by the chamber here is the number of weeks. State unemployment insurance programs, the national standard since the 1960s has been 26 weeks. That's, uh, that's as, usually as long as a state unemployment insurance program will pay benefits. Uh, and the federal programs uh, kick in when unemployment gets high and it gets hard, harder to find a job. So, in the last eight, for the last eight recessions, Congress has always created a federal program that provides additional weeks. That program today is called Emergency Unemployment Compensation. The range of extra weeks is anywhere from 14 to 47 weeks. Congress just reauthorized the program uh, New Year's Eve uh, as part of the fiscal cliff deal. And, it's, and the program is in place for one more year. But be clear, it's probable that we will not see a federal extension beyond 2013. And what the legislature is looking at now is the state's unemployment insurance program going forward either later this year or in 2014. So put the federal program out of the way. What we're talking about is the dollars over in that left column under regular benefits uh, as you see, it went up as high as uh, close to 2.8 billion in 2009. Uh, when uh, we actually add in the rest of 2012, it's going to be again around between 1.3 and 1.4 billion uh, that will be spent on unemployment insurance in in 2012. So um, we're, we're we're dealing with this uh, nationally, and what we've seen is states that. Uh, uh, with governors who have proposed uh, slashing benefits. Uh, but the, the first message, and it's the same in North Carolina as it is in, um, in many other states, is that this, you cannot blame this entire uh, borrowing crisis that results in employers paying extra federal taxes on the recession. Basically, two thirds of it was, should have been anticipated and uh, many states basically in the 1990s did what North Carolina did and went from the idea of forward financing which is you know what your parents always told you to do with your piggy bank which is you know save it for a rainy day because you are going to need that at some point 
Uh, you look at Carolina that was doing that until the early 1990s. They then decided to basically shift from forward financing to a pay-as-you-go uh, kind of a system. So that chart that you saw earlier basically showed that by the time we hit the recession in early 2001, financing was already on a steep decline and basically the fund was depleted by the end of that early 2000s recession in 2003. I think we were, uh, we were down to uh, just about zero. Um, but the same thing was happening nationally. Uh, we were, states were not ready going in. Uh, there were only $38 billion in reserves nationally, whereas in the recession before, there were $54 billion. So clearly, um, you know, business interests had taken control of, um, of unemployment insurance financing. Uh, a lot of it rooted in, hey, we don't have high unemployment. Why, why not just give this money back to employers so they can invest it? Well, um, had all states kind of entered this recession with the, with the proper amount of uh, financing, which is this sort of federal model, which I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but basically it says you should have enough to last you through one year of a recession. Uh, had, had, uh, North, uh, had the states um, met that model going into this recession, then there would have been, uh, they would have had to only borrow $9 billion instead of $50 billion. So um, we talked about uh, some of these tax cuts. But just to, to make it a, a little more crystal clear, um, at the beginning of the 1990s, North Carolina had $1.6 billion in its trust fund. Uh, but it then, through the changes that were made, uh, North Carolina had the sixth lowest tax rate in the country from 1993 to 2002. Employers were paying an average of about $90 per employee. Uh, so that um, by the time they entered this recession, there was about, we're down about $394 million uh, when you're paying out one point, anywhere from one to $2 billion a year. Uh, no surprise that you have to do a lot of federal borrowing. Uh, had, they, had they even entered the recession at the recommended level, uh, the borrowing would have been less than uh, one billion instead of uh, 2.5. So now we're here because this proposal from the North Carolina Chamber, which has turned into a piece of legislation, um, the Chamber commissioned a study. Let me be clear, this study was done by a group called UWC Strategy, Unemployment and Workers' Comp Strategy. This is a group that lobbies on behalf of business before Congress and state legislatures uh, in unemployment insurance matters. <coughs> and a related uh, law firm that works for that same, uh, for that same organization. The, if you read their report, which came out last May, it, the whole focus is North Carolina is out of sync with its region. Uh, North Carolina's benefits are higher than, than those in the rest of the Southeast. Well, that's true. But the rest of the Southeast has some of the least effective unemployment insurance programs in the country. North Carolina is right in the middle of the pack if you are talking about um, the adequacy and effectiveness of its unemployment insurance program nationally. When you look at the numbers, some of which we'll talk about, it's right in the middle, right down the line. And in fact, in terms of taxes on employers, the average tax on employers in North Carolina about $340 per worker. That's 31st in the country. So um, this bill, this chamber study, uh, basically looked at some of the cuts that have been made in some of these other states, including Florida and Georgia, uh, and uh, basically compiles those and adds in some more horrible uh, proposals uh, to basically cut worker benefits at, at every turn. Um, it really um, is pretty much an effort to cut employer taxes by reducing benefits, uh, and that undermines the two primary things that an unemployment insurance program is supposed to do, which is replace wages while work workers are looking for a new job, and to stabilize local economies by pumping up consumer demand. So this is this is only a slice of this bill, which is really an omnibus, uh, I think I call it a parade of horribles, uh, 
uh, in, in uh, discussion earlier. The three things I want to talk about them are on top. I want, we're going to go through in a little bit of detail. They cut the maximum benefit amount. They cut the, the formula for figuring out what the average benefit is. Uh, they reduce the maximum number of weeks below 26. Uh, but there's other things in here too, and I just want to mention those quickly before we go to the major ones. Um, this notion, um, every, every unemployment insurance program says that you must be uh, available for suitable work and you must accept an offer of suitable work. Suitable work in just about every unemployment insurance program starts out something close to what you were making at your last job in terms of wages, something that's suitable for you in terms of your skills and education and training. Uh, this, um, this bill would say that um, after 10 weeks, suitable work, if you've been unemployed 10 weeks, suitable work is 120% of whatever your weekly benefit amount is. Well, the maximum weekly benefit amount that this bill proposes is $350. 120% of that is about $420. It's about a little more than $10 an hour. Basically, this bill would say, after 10 weeks, anybody on unemployment insurance should be accepting a job that pays $10 an hour. Uh, that, I mean, that is wildly inconsistent with all sort of precedent and um, in terms of the purpose of unemployment insurance, which is to try and allow a worker to get back into uh, into the wor workforce somewhere close to where they fell off. It's in all of our interest for people to be earning at close, closer to their maximum capacity than to uh, this sort of uh, race to the bottom uh, uh, scale that they've got here. I mean, if people were gonna, people wanted to take minimum wage jobs, they'd take them in week one. I mean, this is, um, this is really a dangerous thing. There are, um, there are things that were done in recent years to uh, expand benefits in North Carolina. One of them is something called the alternate base period. Again, a uh, very high uh, deep, um, quotient on, on knowing about this, but basically what this, what this does is to allow consideration of very recent earnings. So people who are just coming into the workforce uh, and get laid off quickly, can be, uh, can be eligible for benefits. Uh, this reform proposal will get rid of that. Waiting weeks, 40, about 40 out of 50 states have a waiting week. North Carolina is one of them, which says you gotta wait one week before you um, are eligible for benefits. And if you end up collecting all 26 weeks, then you get that week at the end. But for most people who don't, you, don't, you, you lose a week. Um, it's not really a great policy to begin with, but they're, things the feds have done to push people to, to, to push states to have waiting weeks. We're still trying to figure out what this bill says about it, but if it says what we think it does, which is what the chamber study said, this would impose repeated waiting weeks for a person who's in and out of employment. And this is more and more a bigger segment of the workforce are people who are lose that big job, <clears throat> look for another job, find something that isn't as good, it's part-time, it's temporary, they take that job, they get laid off, they go back and file again. What this bill says is, when you go back and file again, you're gonna wait another week. And even, and, and this is only supposed to happen once a year under current law. If, you, if you're laid off six times in the next six months, you get, you lose a week every time you file for benefits. No state has ever done that, anything like that. No state has even thought about doing anything like that. So this is really, I mean, there's, there's some things buried in here that are just sort of beyond the pale. Um, basically, it stripped, this bill would strip down the reasons that you could leave your job to only work-related reasons. There's a lot of good things in the North Carolina law. If you get, if a job makes you ill, if you have family members with, uh, with serious illnesses, things like that you can leave that job. You're not usually gonna be eligible right away because you're, you, you're attending to the person or you've got, you're not well, but at some point, when you are able to work again, you can collect. Under this bill, you would never be able to collect uh, as a result of that reason. Is that 
I thought maybe my time was up. Uh, okay. Um, so there are, this proposal has only really very minor changes with respect to taxes, uh, which I'll talk about um, very quickly later. So let's talk about the three major things. Um, the maximum weekly benefit. The maximum in North Carolina right now is uh, $525 a week, and that's set by law as two-thirds of what the average annual wage is. And I think the average annual wage is a little over $800 a week in North Carolina. This bill would <laughs> slash the maximum from $525 to $350. That's a one-third cut in the maximum benefit amount. So again, you'll hear me say this a few times, but no state has ever cut their maximum this severely. Um, the, the new maximum is 43% of the current average weekly wage. Uh, you basically, your unemployment insurance system, you want the average wage to get you to around 50% of what you used to be making. So when you, your maximum is only at 43%, you can imagine what that's going to do to the average. Uh, the 350 um, maximum in North Carolina is that does have, um, it's in the top 10, it's ninth right now in the country. Go to 350, you drop to 40th in the country. Um, to give you a sense of people, you know, and, and one of the things you battle when you're dealing with unemployment insurance, particularly when there's a little bit of fatigue around this issue uh, because it's been so prominent for the last four years, is uh, what, kind of the welfareization of, of unemployment, that the, you know, these, these people are, uh, you know, drug users, and they're not really looking for work, and they're slackers. Uh, but the fact, that, you know, the, the the fact is, unemployment insurance keeps people attached to the labor force. And studies show people who are collecting unemployment insurance are looking harder for work than people that that, that aren't collecting. And the fact is, a, a bigger and bigger percentage of people collecting unemployment insurance are coming out of high end, um, higher wage jobs. So in North Carolina, one third of all the workers in North Carolina would qualify for the current $525 maximum, which means all your high wage earners, if they lose their job, imagine living on, you know, going from a thousand a week to <coughs> 350 a week. Um, I think it's important that that, that, that message be out there. Um, the, 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 we're still looking at the dollar impacts on these, the, and Alexandra and others are, are, are um, look, you know, running simulations to try and determine what the costs are. But uh, I've got 100, this, this piece alone costing about 105 million. It's probably more like 150. But, um, the second big piece is changing the formula. Uh, North Carolina does, they have what's called the base period, which is for basically a one year period of recent wages. Uh, North Carolina does what is the most common approach, which is to take the high quarter of earnings and divide by 26. That gives, that's supposed to give you roughly half a week's uh, wages, uh, capped by that 525 uh, maximum. Um, the second most common approach is to take the two high quarters and average them. Um, so a lot of states do that as well. Um, the chamber proposal does something that nobody has ever done, which is to take the last two quarters in that one year base period, which is, as my kids would say, very random. Uh, it, 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 there's, no, there's no real logic other than uh, it's, gonna Im it's gonna impact workers those workers we were talking about who are in and out of benefits, people who qualify for successive benefit years. Because if you've been, if you just happen to have been out of work most of those two quarters, even though you had a lot of wages in the first two quarters, you're gonna have a lousy benefit rate. So it's, it's really uh, very arbitrary and it really depresses um, benefits. And I think it looks to me like it depresses it for workers who are really kind of struggling with repeated bouts of unemployment. Uh, so, so to make the system sort of, it'll work for you once, but don't count on it a second time. Um, maximum weeks of benefits. This is where we have the most recent experience. 
we have um, seven states that have cut the 26-week maximum. Now, for 50 years, nobody touched the 26-week maximum. Uh, a, a couple of states made a small one-week cut, Arkansas and Illinois. But in 2011, we saw Michigan, Missouri, and South Carolina cut from 26 down to 20 weeks. Uh, interesting little side note here. Um, when you cut from 26 to 20, there's a corresponding percentage cut in the federal unemployment benefits that you get. So when I said there's, like right now, there's 47 weeks of federal benefits in North Carolina, if you drop it down, by whatever percentage you drop the state weeks, you're gonna drop uh, the same percentage federal weeks. Um, Florida and Georgia did uh, this thing that North Carolina is, uh, this proposal is now modeling, which is a, a sliding scale that starts at your current very high rate of, and, and says, um, in Florida, it's uh, 20, it's 12 to 23 weeks. In Georgia, it's 20 down to 14. But basically, it says, the, as your unemployment rate drops, so do the maximum weeks. So um, North Carolina kind of combines these two proposals. It says, currently, right now, with your rate is at 9%, which is historically very, very high. The maximum weeks is 20. And if, if, if the rate gets down to 5.5% or lower, it'll go down to 12 weeks. But basically, it drops a week for every half a percent on the way down. Now, again, it's 2014. You don't have a federal program. You're going, people who are currently relying on as much as 73 weeks of benefits wake up in 2014, and assuming that you're still over 9%, it would be 20 weeks, but if you're in the eights, it's 19 weeks, it's 18 weeks. Also, if you don't have a full base period of wages, you get something lower than that as a maximum. This is the most you could possibly get, and it presupposes that you've got a full base period of wages. So this is going on at the same time that 54% um, of all North Carolina claimants are exhausting benefits without having found new employment. That's the eighth highest exhaustion rate in the country. Um, as we said, the average duration of unemployment nationally is about 40 weeks. So this is the time we propose cutting benefits to 20 weeks or 19 weeks or 18 weeks. Um, not, not good economic policy. So the, the impact, as I say, we're still looking at. Um, but it looks like these three proposals alone will cut benefits by about 50%. In other words, whereas if it were in place this year when uh, you've got 1.3 or 1.4 billion dollars <coughs> paid out, if those three cuts were in place this year, it would drop to about 700 million. Um, the, um, we drive down recipiency. Right now, only 24% of all unemployed workers um, receive state unemployment benefits. The federal bumps it up to about 50%, but again, you, if you don't have a federal program in 2014, you're talking about starting with only 24% of people getting benefits and working your way down. If you want to follow Florida's model, which is what's here, they now have the lowest recipiency rate in the country at 16% and still head and sell. Um, the average benefit amount, I mean, this is an important piece in terms of advocacy out there. Uh, the, the average benefit amount in, um, in the U.S. is around $300 a week. North Carolina is right around there, about $296 per week. Puts you about 23rd in the country. Even with that higher maximum, the average benefit in North Carolina is right in the middle of the pack. And this would definitely drive down that average uh, to, you know, we start getting down toward Florida levels. Where you're, which in Florida is around $230 average benefit. Uh, at some point you start to say, can, a, can an unemployed family, what can you do, can you, you know, what, what can you accomplish with that? Can, can it really get you from here to that next job? Can you afford to keep looking for a job close to your skill level or do you have to take that minimum wage job? Because you effectively don't have a meaningful wage replacement uh, system. So um, 
the Chambers bill, I think, is basically uh, very one-sided. Um, you know, as it said, the, the average per employee cost is about $340, which is 31st in the country. The U.S. average is 417 Right now, um, because there is still a zero tax rate in North Carolina, about one out of five um, uh, North Carolina employers are paying no unemployment insurance taxes, which is like, imagine you have an auto insurance pool in which one out of five, you know, car owners don't pay into to the pool. It's no surprise that you're going to run in, into some bumps. The, the, there are some things here. They actually do create a new minimum, but it's embarrassingly low, 0.06%, would raise about $600,000 uh, total. Uh, they bump up the maximum by 0.06%, raises about $27 million a year. Strangely, this proposal goes after governmental and nonprofit employers. Now, these employers are not part of the system because they don't pay taxes, they reimburse. So basically, you get laid off from a nonprofit, the nonprofit pays dollar for dollar for the benefits, but they don't pay taxes on their employees. What this would do is basically create new surcharges on nonprofits and governmentals, <coughs> who are frankly not the source of the problem. Uh, there is a, something in here called, which Alexander could uh, be much more illuminating on, but a shift from what a current tax schedule system to a formula system. Uh, we're still running early numbers on that, but it definitely means a tax cut for uh, North Carolina employers. So what we're talking about is a bill that would cut benefits by six to seven hundred million a year. Uh, it's looking like the tax cut is probably in the 200 million a year range going in the wrong direction because how are we, how is North Carolina getting out of debt? This, again, I apologize for the geekiness of what I'm about to say, but basically once North Carolina's employers have been borrowing for two years, the way the federal government recoups that money is through um, increasing federal unemployment taxes. So uh, in the first year, every North Carolina employer had to pay an extra $21 per worker back to the federal government. And this is just so the feds can recoup the principal on the borrowing. Once it's another year goes by, it jumps up to $42. Another year goes by, jumps up to $63. Basically, these federal penalties are temporary until you get back to zero. But the reality is you're only getting back to zero. You want your unemployment insurance trust fund to be strong enough so that you are ready for the next inevitable recession. This does not do this. This keeps sending uh, employer unemployment taxes down. Um, so what do you end up with? You've got basically pay-as-you-go <coughs> financing. They're only going to raise the revenues that are needed to pay this new uh, low capacity unemployment insurance program. You're not prepared for the next recession. And, when, and in the meantime, the program is not, a, is not an effective economic stabilizer. Half as much money is going into the North Carolina economy. Even uh, you know, Mark Zandi, the economist uh, from, from uh, Moody's, who's always quoted and is, it was John McCain's advisor will tell you that the, you know, the, the impact of unemployment insurance, it has a multiplier effect because for every dollar of unemployment insurance that is paid out, it generates about a dollar sixty in economic activity in, in local communities because the merchants receive money and, and they're using it in other places. So it's, it's you're really just sort of taking a, a self-inflicted wound to, to, the, uh, to the economy by draining this much money out of your UI program at a time when it is still this hard to, to find new employment. So um, I've gone on uh, much longer than the buzzer allowed. Uh, and uh, I guess now we're going to build one of Are we going to take questions? Go ahead. I got one. Bill's got one. I don't know. Uh, you ready? 
Yep. Sure. Um, you mentioned that one out of five employers don't pay unemployment insurance. Why, why is that? Uh, because the statute still provides for a zero tax rate, basically for employers who do not have um, have not had employees recently filed for unemployment benefits. It's it's run on what they call an experience rating system. Your tax rate's higher if a lot of people are collecting that used to work for you. It's lower if if not. But most states will still impose an unemployment tax on employers even if no worker ever files for benefits. It is, in fact, an insurance program. Can you explain again that the nonprofits and government, how the reimbursement works? Thought that might raise a few ears in the room. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there's the normal way that, you know, the, the trust fund is subsidized is through uh, private sector employers are paying a tax on their workers, and the tax rate is set by their level of activity, their experience. Uh, but governmental employers, municipal, state, and nonprofit employers have the option to be what they call reimbursers, which is which means their employees are not, they don't have to pay taxes on their employees per head. Instead, whenever somebody um, is laid off and collects benefits, uh, they get billed once a month for the amount of the benefits. Uh, so because of that, this group is normally outside of the system. Uh, and they don't, um, when the, so the health of the system is really up to um, private sector employers. So when things get bad, there's a 20% surcharge that private sector employers are paying. Um, this bill basically pulls the nonprofits and governmentals in somewhat by saying that you need to have, I think, a one, and I don't know the exact how this all plays out, but you have to maintain some kind of reserve in the fund, and you are subject to, I think, a 20% surcharge that all private sector employers are until the fund gets healthy again. So it's I would call it a quirky uh, response to the problem. Uh, most, certainly I know most municipal employers are, are not set up to, I mean, it's a, it will be an additional cost of government. George, I have a two-part question. The first part, I want to make sure I get this about the last two quarters, because it seems to me that in a typical situation in a lot of uh, businesses, the business is winding down, perhaps, and maybe there are, you know, there, there are lots of people are getting laid off, and there's less work to go around, and so quite often they'd be cutting hours for people in the la you know, over the last six months of your job. But this is going to actually compound that problem for the worker by saying that those last six months where they were trying to keep you on, and maybe they were working you a half or two thirds time, that will be the basis for determining what your unemployment benefit will be once they finally give up and close the shop. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think that, that's, that's right. In that scenario, um, you know, particularly the worker who's holding off on filing, yeah. uh, maybe they, had, they should have been filing for partial unemployment benefits, but they waited until they got fully laid off to file. I mean, uh, just, again, this is the base period is in North Carolina. It's the first four of the last five completed quarters. So if you, were, you lost your job today, we'd skip over the fourth quarter of 2012 and we'd look at the 12 months before that. So your, your wages from October 2011 through September 2012. And for some crazy reason, your benefit amount is only gonna be based on what you earned in, those, uh, in the second and third quarter of 2012, uh, uh, you know, from uh, April through September. Uh, so as best as it's term, that's basically just a way somebody on the other side came up with an idea and said, well, here's a plausible way and it'll probably end up in people getting less. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've, I watch Homeland, so I'm very paranoid about everything, but uh, the, uh, you know, I, I've got to think that you don't, there's a, there's a model out there. Many, I don't want to say many states, but enough, those states that have said, 
We want to bring down the average weekly benefit amount that had a law that looked like North Carolina with the average of one of the highest quarter. Just about uniformly, they all said, let's take the average of the two highest quarters. That's the sort of option B that's out there. This is the first time we've seen, let's, let's take two quarters, but not the two highest, just the two last. And so why do you go with the two last? Uh, it, and when I look at, you know, I, and I, we haven't, I don't, it's too early to sort of parse out the numbers, but I certainly know that one large category of people who would be impacted are people who are what we call second benefit year claimants. You've been, you, got, you lost your job a year ago, you've been in and out, you're, it's a year later, you happen to be unemployed again, you file again, that one year base period moves forward, and guess what, there's a whole bunch of time in there where you weren't working. Even though you've been doing enough to otherwise qualify, but you just, it just seems to me like it's um, one result, I'm not gonna say it's deliberate, but one result is that somebody who's filing a second benefit year is more likely to have a very low rate or in fact be ineligible altogether. Since part of this is the effort um, to put more money into the economy, are you able to quantify how much has to come out in um, various kinds of public services? Mm. Like uh, food stamps or, you know, yeah, I mean that. That I mean that's a great question, and I, I don't have a I don't have a number. Certainly, this was an argument that we made in our national campaign around the federal extensions. Okay, you throw two million people off the rolls. Where are they going to go? They're going to rely more heavily on community resources. Um, you know, uh, food pantries. In some instances, homeless shelters. Uh, you know, the, these are costs that are, are working their way back to, to other uh, community stakeholders. So, uh, yeah, no, but, but clearly, clearly you don't take an unemployment insurance program, cut it in half, which is what this proposal does, and not see major repercussions throughout the social service world in North Carolina. Can you make the case then that you are um, substituting costs that should go to employers and uh, putting it on the entire population? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, well, we tried to make that case, Will, Bill, and, <laughs> and all of you try to make that case, yes. Uh, but, let, I mean, let's make no mistake, your legislature has basically just taken a report from the North Carolina Chamber and turned it into a piece of legislation. So how responsive they are to that argument is your major challenge. I'm, I'm looking for the second part of your presentation that shares with us the good news <laughs> and the encouraging message, right? So, so when you look at um, Georgia or Florida, those states that have taken on some kind of reform in this area, and as, as all of us know, <coughs> much of that, if not all of it, took place in this same kind of political environment. Governor, legislature, you know, in a position to help with that. Uh, in terms of the ability to, for advocacy groups to impact the initial proposal, if you know anything about what the initial proposals look like, being able to impact that and get something in. I know you work with a number of organizations around the country. Give us some hope that <laughs> give, us, give us some, uh, tell us we got a fighting chance or something. Yeah. Uh, what, what's been your experience in this area? Because I, I uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron, this is Tania. Please bring in the copies to room 104 when you have a chance. Please bring the copies to 104 when you have a moment. Oh, that's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> bring the copies to 104. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I, I try to be an optimistic person. Uh, uh, Florida and Georgia were very tough experiences, and, and obviously I think the, the variable here, you know, I'm here as a uh, sort of like a national perspective, now, I'm trying not to get too deep into what, what your politics are, but uh, let me just take the experience of Florida where the, I think 
the, the governor in Florida was fully invested in all of the change that went down there. And there, we've got a complaint filed with the Secretary of Labor around Florida's program because they did some things that we haven't discussed here and fortunately are not yet in this bill, but were really all about disenfranchising unemployed workers. What they, what they did down there was, uh, and it was tucked in like, you know, the 100th page of the bill, was uh, when this bill takes effect, you can no longer file your claims by telephone, you have to file electronically. And uh, it didn't actually say that, which is why nobody caught it, but basically on August 1st, 2011, they shut down their call centers, which is the way that people file for unemployment benefits in this country, and said you have to file online. No exceptions. So you got people without computers, you got people, uh, of course, there's the, the, the computer applications only in English and Spanish. Um, Basically, you got people crowding into libraries with libraries teaching them how to use a mouse. Uh, and, and they, in addition to making this sort of electronic application, which makes it harder for people to file, there's no, you, you can't get help on the phone while you're, while you're filing. There's no language assistance. And they implement something called an initial skills assessment, which is after you work your way through this half hour kind of complicated electronic application, there's a 45 question test you have to take, uh, which is language, math, and research skills. And they say it's to help you find a job, but guess what, you don't get your first check until you complete that. We start seeing um, within the first six months, like 100,000 people get disqualified on that. And they also do something where they say your work search has to be submitted electronically. Now states can require you to look for as many jobs as they want in a week. In Florida, it's pretty high, they say five. But the, 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 the trick was you have to submit all this documentation related to your work search electronically in this lousy electronic application that doesn't work so good. So a year in, we've seen somewhere close to 200,000 people get disqualified from benefits for reasons that are largely procedural. There, there's been a ton of negative publicity about the Florida program. It really has become the poster child for everything that can go, um, that, can, that you can do bad with unemployment insurance. And I, I would hope a new governor would not want to be emulating what's going on down there. Um, I do think that uh, there are, um, you know, the, the, the economic message, I mean, is, is important. And, and I don't, this bill, unfortunately, I mean, really, it, put, it, it puts um, North Carolina really uh, in, the, in the lower echelon. You really, uh, in terms of how your unemployment insurance program would stack up, against the rest of the country, it would be, um, it would make it one of the least effective and why, and in doing so, dr rapidly pull $700 million out of your economy, why you'd want to do that, I don't know. That would seem, I don't know that was hope, but it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what? We pay off the debt under those circumstances. I say there's no sacrifice by employers, but they would say, oh, there's plenty of sacrifice because those federal tax credits that are happening, that's basically over the next three years, uh, the federal unemployment taxes are gonna go up. Um, it's $42 extra a year this year, it'll go to 63 the year after that, and maybe to 84 the year after that. But then you'll be paid off, and it'll go away. So employer sacrifice, so you will get to zero. Uh, employer sacrifice though is temporary. Worker sacrifice is permanent. That's the difference here. And you're still only at zero. You're not, you're not at, uh, you know, anywhere close to where you ought to be, which is somewhere between one and a half and two billion probably in your, in your trust fund. Yes. Yeah. I wonder if there are any examples of states that introduced 
similar reform, which would weaken the UI system, and it was defeated. And in particular, if there are any examples of business coming out and saying, hey, this is bad for our state, we want to attract good employees. Mm -hmm. I'm still looking for the hope. Yeah, I mean, um, let me say that, and this is something, um, one of the elements that you've not seen a lot of it thus far is the cutting of the weekly benefit amount. And that's because there, in, this, in these federal extensions, there has been this a little piece of federal law um, called the non-reduction rule, which basically says, states, you enter into an agreement where the federal government is gonna pay these extensions, but if you want that money, you have to agree that you're not gonna do anything that cuts the average weekly benefit amount below its, where it is right now. So um, in general, no states have done that uh, in the last four years. Um, this non-reduction rule was just renewed, but it's gonna end the end of this year, and I think it's a very safe assumption that it's not around. So I think there's a question here about if you are gonna cut benefits, whether it can happen in July or whether it's got to wait till January of 2014, how that might all play out, whether the state keeps the federal extension. Uh, it's all subject to an agreement uh, with the governor, so there's some control there. But um, in general, you haven't seen a couple of states were able to bring down their rate a little bit because there was a, a gap where the non-reduction rule wasn't in place for uh, a brief period of time and Congress kind of basically allowed these three states to, to do a little bit of a reduction. One of them, two, one was Indiana, another one was Rhode Island. Um, but um, I think the states that have been successful, Colorado is a state that managed to uh, deal with things by a combination of increased revenues and uh, by what they call program integrity measures, which was just being a little bit more rigorous in terms of work search and things like that. And they didn't really do substantial benefit cuts. Rhode Island did some cuts, but they were, I would say, generally more thoughtful. Uh, they were still, they still cut the average benefit. Um, I'm not, you know, a, a significant amount, but they didn't go after the maximum. I mean, states, I mean, the response, and I've kind of hinted at some of the things that, you know, responsible states have done. Because this situation has come in cycles. When I was in Connecticut in the 90s, uh, we were a state that had a high quarter. We went to an average of two high quarters. It reduced the average payout between five and 10%. Uh, there's things like that. Um, I'll throw a pitch in for something that I think all states ought to be looking at, which is uh, work sharing. Uh, the, about um, half the states in the country have a work sharing program, and for those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically uh, an alternative to layoffs in which if an employer needs to reduce production, instead of laying off one worker, uh, the employer might uh, reduce the hours of five workers by 20%. They each get 20% of that one worker's unemployment benefit. Uh, and the employer keeps paying their their benefits as though they were, were working full time. Uh, this is a program that's been kind of uh, low on the radar for a long time, but in February, Congress just made a major national investment in it. States that want to do it now can basically get their costs reimbursed for the next couple of years. And it, um, it really, uh, there's a lot of, in, in almost every state where it exists and businesses have used it, because it is completely a voluntary program, uh, it has um, it, it's gotten very strong business support. Uh, in and I try not in these settings to not talk about Europe because they yeah you, you run out of town as a crazy this crazy liberal, but they, they do a lot of this in Germany and basically their unemployment rate using work sharing about a third of all their unemployment claims were work sharing claims and their unemployment rate never got above seven and a half percent during the recession. And, and a lot of economists think it was because in general, more German employers were just saying reducing hours. It's a great thing for morale too, just in terms of um, not, you know, not laying off your least senior workers and the employers, they, 
get to retain um, skilled workers. So when they do need them, when production picks up and they need them again, they're still there. They don't have to go out and hire and retrain. Uh, sorry, a tangent. We probably have time for maybe one more question. George, can you, I don't know if you, you can't come, ask questions. I, I, if the minimum, it, there's this new idea, it seems, there's the maximum being cut from 26 to 20, but North Carolina, in this bill, as I understand, is introducing a concept of minimum weeks. You know, I, I wanted to look at that more closely, but my, if, if North Carolina is like a lot of other states, um, you know, they have a maximum of 26 weeks, but that presupposes that they've got a full, um, you know, that, that basically the worker worked throughout their base period or has at least an X number of dollars of wages. Uh, a lot of states will say, yeah, there's a 26 week maximum, but if you only worked half of your base period, the maximum is 14 weeks or, you know. So in the actual North Carolina bill, um, or the chamber bill, brings a sliding scale down to, for the max to 12 to 20, but corresponding to that is if somebody's got only half of a base period with wages, they might have a, a corresponding dollar a week's amount that's even lower than that. So I was trying not to say every bad thing that was in there. But. Well, actually, I'm gonna ask one last question because I think it's maybe a takeaway point if I'm getting this right for folks that maybe can't follow all the intricate details. We've been told that we need to do all this stuff because we have to pay back the federal government. What you're telling us is the federal government's going to get its money, am I right? They're going to get their money regardless of whether this happens or not. That's right. I mean, I think this this will uh, they'll get it, they'll get it maybe a year faster under this scenario, but um, you know, once once you're on the other side of this around 2017, under this scenario, you've got this very low cost. Right unemployment insurance system that's going to guarantee that employers can keep their rates low or even lower than they are now. So we're basically swapping out which is a pretty good system for a lousy system in order to pay back the federal government a year faster. That's, that's not an unfair way to put it. Mm. Well, maybe that's a takeaway for folks as they go forward and talk to their friends and neighbors about this issue. It's, uh, it's being, I think maybe we're being sold a bit of a bill of goods as to how necessary it will be. Well, join me in thanking George for coming on the board.